good morning and thank you for being here so that we can show you our love and appreciation for all the world of manufacturers in our fair city. This event is of course made possible by our outstanding sponsors. Our presenting sponsor is Carl A. Nelson and Company and our program sponsor is Dexter Laundry. Thank you for your support for this event and allowing us to show our, to have an opportunity to show the love. Fairfield has a rich history of entrepreneurship and manufacturing. Looking around the room, there are founding fathers of many of our great organizations. Manufacturing in Fairfield is as diverse as our populace. In addition to manufacturing the, project, the products for purchase, our area manufacturers support one another, creating pieces or parts or molds. We, love, we look to our neighbors to help guide our future. Manufacturing is the backbone of our society, from beautiful stained glass in churches around the world to amazing tile that is a beautiful work of art, state-of-the-art washers and dryers, and parts to help keep our farmers in the fields to feed America, making our roads safer, our buildings more innovative, and making our homes smell better. My goodness, Fairfield has quite the impact on our world. In addition to what you manufacture in your buildings, you bring awareness and opportunities to Fairfield. Without you, many of the great things that we cherish here in our community would not be here. We appreciate you, and we hope that you feel the love and appreciation, not only from your chamber, but from your entire community. Uh, would Mayor Connie and Matt Doty from Wheaton. Um, it's my honor to introduce our mayor, Connie Boyer, to proclaim the month of May. Our fearless leader, Chad Christensen from Agra, is out of town, so our friend Matt Doty from Wheaton Companies will stand in. Great, thank you. And I also want to express my sincere appreciation for all of you for the hard work that you do every day. A special thank you to founders who are here because they had a vision and a dream. And I know we have to keep that dream and vision alive for our future Fairfield. So again, thank you for being here. We acknowledge your hard work and your dedication to our community. And I want to say a special thanks regarding the child care center that's coming up. Can't wait to see it finished. We have to take care of our little people because we know at some point they're going to take care of us. And uh, so again, thank you for your commitment to your families and your employees. It's just, it's a wonderful thing showing your partnership in our wonderful community. Thank you. So here is the proclamation. Whereas the manufacturers of industrial goods and services in the city of Fairfield have played a major role in creating a solid foundation of commerce in the city of Fairfield for over 100 years, and whereas the men and women employed within the manufacturing workforce constitute a substantial impact on the economy and growth of this community, and the state of Iowa has more than 410 manufacturing companies and accounts for more than 33 billion in Iowa's GDP. And whereas Iowa's manufacturing firms supply more than 218,000 jobs with an annual compensation of 73,000 to Iowans representing more than 14% of the state's total employment. And whereas the products and services from these firms are exported throughout the international marketplace and these operations continue to establish an even broader base of products, distribution, and whereas the citizens of Fairfield, Iowa are proud of the work ethic within this community and wish to recognize it, and whereas the retention and growth of our manufacturing sector is a major part of our all, overall community economic strategy. Now, therefore, be it resolved, I, Connie Boyer, Mayor of the City of Fairfield, Iowa, proclaim the month of October as Fairfield Manufacturers Month and salute the members of the Fairfield Manufacturers Association for their dedication to our community to, provi to provide the jobs necessary to sustain our economy and for their contributions to the quality of life in our city. Thank you very much. All right. Hopefully you're enjoying your tacos. Our speaker today recently spoke at the Iowa Association of Chambers of Conference, Commerce at the Fall Conference alongside Iowa Workforce Development Director Beth Townsend. Krista Tidro is the Executive Director of the South Central Iowa Workforce Area Local Workforce Development Board. It's the most ridiculous title on the planet. <laughs> 
This board is a nonprofit organization overseeing the workforce services in 14 counties, including Jefferson County. It provides visionary leadership and oversight to workforce development in our region. Please welcome Krista. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mindy. Um, and thank you all manufacturers for being here. Um, I'm excited, I love tacos, so when I saw that I was like, yes, that's so good. Um, all right, well we'll go ahead and go ahead and get started. Um, wanna, a little bit about me, I am an Iowa native. Um, I uh, really grew up mostly in Ottumwa. Um, I will say there's uh, manufacturers, both of my parents are prison felons and meth addicts, so I grew up in and out of the foster system. And my parents, um, as they re-entered into the community, um, they were employed uh, with with manufacturing companies, uh, gave them an opportunity to really establish some of the uh, stability that they needed in order to get to a place where my mom eventually became a nurse, right? But she needed a, a place to start. Um, and then my uh, biological dad, he still struggles a little, but he is employed uh, by a manufacturer. So I, I wanna say thank you from a personal perspective that you all look at workforce development talent and you're like, hey, we, we want to support um, you, but then also we need talent. So we, we'll search for it basically where everyone's at, wherever we can get it. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about some workforce stats. So you can go ahead and go, Mindy. I don't know, we're gonna. We're gonna have some fun with that. Um, so basically, as I've started looking at the population, and I'm a rural advocate for rural Iowa as well, we started looking at the population and then some of the data that told us about what does the future workforce really look like. So right now, um, we have about 78,000, almost 79,000 folks that are retiring soon, within the next three to five years, okay? Then from that, we have Gen Z and millennials, which is people that are the age from 13 to 36, um, and we've only got roughly 76,000 of those folks, and then we have 118,000 jobs. So we really are realizing, you know, we aren't going to be getting the talent in that we need in order to fill the jobs that, that we have. We can go to the next one. So anybody in here, bonus points, know what the generation of zero to 12 is called? I had to look this up. Alpha? Yeah, hey, there you go. Um, so it's Generation Alpha, um, which was just interesting. What? Oh, you got, okay. Um, it was interesting to me uh, that we don't have data yet on Generation Alpha, but Gen Z is projected to have at least 18 jobs with six different careers or in six different industries. So that means that a company may have someone for three to five years from that population that's coming into the future workforce. So it led me to start thinking about like, what does it mean for educators to try to educate someone if they're supposed to be preparing them for the workforce? And then what does it mean for the organizations where retention is key and you're having to dump money into retraining and um, attrition rates are, are wild? So, um, so that's a little bit what we've been thinking about. We can go to the next one. So kind of why am I here to talk to you today? Like uh, Mindy said, I have a ridiculously long uh, title for the organization that we work with. Basically, we're your local workforce board and we are supposed to be, I'm the executive director, um, focusing on what we can do to support our region. So our region, I don't know how well you can see this, is this um, green one shape in the middle of the state. So we have an odd uh, area that we, we cover, um, but it works out well because in Marshalltown, Ottumwa, some of our communities in our rural rurality, um, it, rural reality, I think I just blended those, um, is, is similar. So we can go to the next one. So a little bit about our economy or our overview. So within our area, we already kind of talked about this a little bit. We've got 229,000 people. Um, our regional employment looks about 102,000 and our average um, compensation for uh, wage is 56, uh, $56,000. So we can go to the next one. So then I drilled down and, and our board's been really investing in um, data and making sure that we can inform our decisions and help our stakeholders, which would be industry, chambers, associations, um, to really understand how, how they can prepare. So are you on the regional job supply? Yeah. Okay, I'm just making sure. Um, so with that, when we look at our region, the 14 counties that I showed you in that slide a minute ago, in manufacturing specifically, um, our projection is that we will have 7% more jobs in the future. So if that means we're gonna have more jobs in the future and I just talked to you about the lack of people that we have, that becomes a bit of a challenge. Go to the next one. 
So then what's that look like in Jefferson County? So specifically in Jefferson County in manufacturing, it is projected that you will have about a 5% increase. So just 2% under the regional average, but a 5% increase in your manufacturing um, jobs that will be added. We'll go to the next one. So our talent supply or our talent demand. So in manufacturing, what we're seeing is regionally, there's about 13,000, almost 14,000 jobs um, that are available specific to manufacturing. And I pulled all the different codes for manufacturing and what goes into that. Um, and that's, that's how this data is populated. And then in the county alone, there's roughly 1,200 jobs specifically for manufacturing. Let me go to the next one. And then when I looked up compensation, this was kind of interesting to me, but we think about we're in rural Iowa. So compensation, national average, 53,000 for jobs on average for all the different roles within manufacturing. Um, our regional uh, average wage would be 46,000. So in Jefferson County, I was um, s uh, s s delighted, I suppose you could say. Um, we're at 48,000, that's, that's, we're a little bit above. So you guys have a competitive advantage in the fact that you are um, able to draw talent in, in that regard. We can go to the next one. So as we delved into the data a little deeper, it was really interesting to me as well as our talent demand. So in our 14 counties, we have 345 companies that are, are essentially competing for um, talent in the manufacturing field. So in Jefferson County, we have about 35 different manufacturing um, businesses that would be looking for talent in the field. Also, uh, roughly 141 openings um, for specific occupations, so if it's a welder or a machinist or et cetera, um, throughout the 14 county. So we have a few less occupational openings, um, about 127 uh, specific openings for manufacturing roles. All right, now, this is another interesting thing. I love youth education. Um, I know that there's a lot of uh, the, the companies in here that invest in talent uh, development programs, bringing kids in to say, you know, how can we do some work-based learning? How can we do internships? Um, what does an apprenticeship look like? So the future is truly with our, with our youth. Um, so when we look at the graduate pipeline, there's 400 and I think 96 different programs that can be provided to train for manufacturing occupations. Within that, 64 programs in our 14 county area graduated some students, completed someone with a certificate or a degree or diploma in the field. If we look at the county specifically, are roughly 16 different programs that are offered. So that could be um, something with my friend uh, Kevin Pope over here, who's with Indian Hills. They have some short-term training programs. Could be over there with my friend Sam, who works at the Iowa Work Center, and they have different programs there. Um, it could be apprenticeship that you've um, gotten together with a, uh, an association um, to, to arrange. That's what that means. And then overall, we can see we've got um, what do we have here? Oh, yep, the completions out of there. And then just, again, openings within the field, right? So are we really educating and do we have the pipeline? This data says, you know, in our regional area, we don't really have enough people completing specific certificates to fill the openings. And in our, our county, you do. You have a lot of people completing um, programs. All right, so we can go to the next. So again, why am I here talking to you all about this? <laughs> So I'm pretty visual, and um, my friend uh, Matt and Warren, Warren sits on my board, so uh, thank you, Fairfield, for that. And Matt, uh, I was in Leadership Iowa with him last year, and, and I've been learning a lot in my role. Iowa's boards weren't in place like this until about a year and a half ago, and so um, it's been a, a learning process, and Mindy's looking at her watch, I'll, I'll speed it up. No, you're good, okay. Um, but they kind of helped me hone this concept, I'm very visual, is that our board is really just like a, a manufacturer in a sense. Our customers are the industry, it's business, it's our chambers, our economic developers. And what we're supposed to be doing is everybody needs, I know I don't wanna call people a product, but everybody needs a skilled job worker right now. So when we think about that, who's the manufacturer of those skilled workers? Who should be? our K through 12 system, our workforce programs, um, you, you know, you name it. There's lots of different places you can get this training. So our board's job is to kind of be that oversight and through line to say, what is it that you manufacturers or whoever in whatever industry needs? Are you getting it? If not, 
we go back to that system that's supposed to be producing these job seekers and say, what is it that we need to do? Um, and so that's kind of the overview of what we're doing, listening to the market demand and then ensuring the quality assurance and the production of said skilled job seeker. We can go to the next one. So then what do we do and how have we been approaching this? When we see um, all this different data, what, is it, what does it all mean? So we, again, invested in data. At first, we didn't have this information readily accessible and, and broken down in a way that made sense so we could provide it to our stakeholders so you could plan strategically. So we invested in um, MZ Burning Glass, it's now Lightcast, but basically a lot of the data I pulled from there pulls from lots of different data sources into one base. Um, so if you would like reports like that, my friend Josh back there um, asked for one for filled for a few different industries, so we were able to provide that. Um, the other thing we've been doing is went in to talk to some students. Um, we had roughly 50 students that we talked to at uh, the Otomo Community School District, and 30 of them did not even know they could take career technical education training courses, and they were juniors and seniors. So there's a disconnect. So we said, what would make it easier so that you knew and could advocate for yourself to do that? So we redesigned the, the program course guide so students could see, I've got construction up here, we'll work on manufacturing next if, if anyone wants to help. Um, and, and that way students could see who are the companies hiring locally, what occupations are there, what wages can I get, and what classes do I need to take? Um, so those are a couple of our recent initiatives. We've also become an apprenticeship intermediary so we can support companies getting their apprenticeships up and going um, if that's one way to train your workforce. So right now we're in the process of identifying different funding strategies to help us with initiatives to uh, support capacity and developing workforce. And then um, let's see, we are also looking at starting up industry sector partnerships. So while there's competition in the room, right, we say competing companies for this talent, well, if we can train the talent from a very young age, as long as they're staying, because we need the people to be here, then if they have the skill set they need, what do, I mean, if any one of you gets them, that will be a win, right, for our area. So um, industry sector partnerships really come together, and it sounds like a little bit what your manufacturing association could be a really good opportunity for us to collaborate here to identify opportunities um, to solve for workforce challenges. You go next. All right. so. Iowa Works Centers. Anybody here heard of Iowa Works Centers? Yes, yeah, yeah, Warren. Warren's delved way deeper into it than you ever thought he would. Um, so with that, we can go to the next one. What do, you, what do we have there? So our board oversees the workforce centers, but then we also should be partnering with chambers, economic developers, et cetera. But this specific component, there are resources in those centers um, that can be provided, we have different solutions. So it might be where, oh, hey, uh, we've, we realize we need a short-term training program, so our board finds out about that. We're gonna reach out to Kevin and say, hey, Kevin, you might have some, I love how workforce development, it's like every industry has 260 E, F, G, it's the alphabet of things, but there's a whole alphabet we wanna figure out for you to make a solution really easy to get you what you need, um, which then pays for your uh, talent development efforts. All right, we'll go next, and I'm almost done. So. When we look at this, who do we serve? So the centers are really serving the people that are coming in, and we're trying to get them connected to jobs and to the skills they need in order to get to you as industry. So we're looking at, we have priority, we serve anybody that comes in, but we really have priority populations. That means we have a specific focus on serving veterans, folks um, in reentry, like I mentioned, both my parents needed um, some support and help to get to a place where they could be sustainable um, and independent. Um, individuals with different disabilities, uh, new Americans, I heard this term and liked it, um, rather than immigrant or refugee or label, like people who are new to America, um, let's see what we can do to help support them. Um, in this area specifically, we've um, been purchasing for companies uh, natural language processing and starting to look at how we, which means if I'm speaking whatever language I'm speaking, uh, you can hear me in English and the person vice versa can hear you in their native tongue. So we can then tr train folks a little faster, get them on those lines so they can be safer. And we're also looking at how can we build out your onboarding um, so it is in the native tongue of the folks that um, are here. So uh, we're also looking at serving folks who are unemployed to get them reemployed. And then of course, youth. We can go on to the next. And then business. So. Business consulting, again, I've talked about customized training, registered apprenticeship, referrals, uh, and then some hiring events. So this business consulting piece um, is really interesting because IWD, Iowa Workforce Development, has um, established a unit for business engagement. Excuse me, our state had not had a business engagement unit, and that was a little bit um, 
different than most states because most states do have a business division at their workforce development office. So um, I think that might be on my next slide. Actually, we can go there. <laughs> Mindy, thank you. So really this idea of we want to serve employees. The division administrator that was hired has never been in public service and she told me, she's like, oh, I almost felt like my, when I told my dad I was going into this, I, he was, you know, run from the government, don't trust the government. And um, she retired and I don't know, Sherry Barron, I'm not sure if you all know her, but she was a CEO of a manufacturing firm. And so she really does understand um, and has been listening. So she said, we need to get this so it's like, Toyota or the lean manufacturing, what's so easy that I can just push a button and figure out what I need? Because I can't wade through all of this public craziness. I need workers and I need help and I need it now. So we started looking at how can we really make it clear about what we can do. So we'll go to the next slide. And there's a few services on there. And I'm gonna get this to our friend Mindy and she's gonna send it out and go from there. But uh, with that new division, uh, there's a business engagement division, division and then a workforce training education. Um, so with that, they have a team that is meeting with folks. And I think I saw Warren in front of you. You've got a little thing from Sam. So they're sending out folks um, to connect with manufacturers, to connect with all businesses, to see what does it look like? What do you need? How can we be agile and really responsive? Um, and with that, you can scan that here if you would like to meet with them. And I would encourage you to do so. We've already seen in our area returns on those investments in the term of that, hey, I need some labor market data that I can apply um, and give to stakeholders real local. So I met with the labor market division team and they're getting that to us so I can get more data for you to uh, help you make informed decisions. Um, so with that, I'm thinking that might be my last slide. But again, when I think about rural, um, it's something where we all are going to have to come together. Um, I used to think, oh, we don't have enough, but rural is resource rich. And you all in this community uh, partner, you give back to the community, you're providing jobs. And as we come together to focus on workforce challenges, if we can do it as an industry, I think we'll have better outcomes and better results. So. Um, Mindy also has my contact information. I would love to hear from uh, the said teams in here and see how we can come together to support. Um, I don't know if we have time for questions or not, but and I can't promise you I'll have an answer, but I can try. No? Good? OK. Thank you, Krista. Uh, so I'll be sending out the slides um, and her contact information. Feel free to reach out to her. As she mentioned, Sam from Iowa Workforce Development put some things on your tables. That's just a survey to help him know what your needs look like so he can do what he needs to do. So we're now to the portion where we are talking about each manufacturer. Um, and I will pass the mic around. Um, you know how this works. Tell us what you're doing, what you're, tell me something that is just making you super excited today. Way to go. You go first. You're never shy. <laughs> yep. Do you want to come up front? Sure. Uh, I never get to go first, so this is good. I, I won't have to repeat after what everybody says. I think, um, you know, first of all, just from my perspective, I'm sure you're going to hear the same thing from most, most people. Our challenges are the same, mostly centered around workforce. I'll just take the brief opportunity to thank our partners, um, starting with Iowa State Bank. You know, that's a any good business organization has to have a good financial institution behind them. We appreciate what they do for us. So I'll, I'll take this opportunity to, to plug them and, and to say that we're grateful for their partnership and, and what they do for us. All the attorneys, accountants, and advisors that help us, we just appreciate. Uh, more important than any partner that we have is our employees. We're up in employment this year. Um, so we're excited about what we're doing in, in terms of growth. I think the one thing that I'll share that I would encourage probably off the heels of Krista and what she just talked about. We were extremely honored to participate in the governor's STEM uh, opportunity of externships this summer, uh, which goes deep into your high school or middle school organizations and takes teachers who have an opportunity about learning about industry and embedding themselves into your business over a, a 60 to 75 day time period. We were really fortunate to have David Kramer, who was an art teacher at, at the high school, came to our Creative Edge business for a little over two months and participated with us as, a, as an employee, really. Uh, but what he was really there for was to understand what our business did 
and how he as an educator to, could take that back into the high school system and the middle school system and, and basically steer kids that he knows have an aptitude uh, to do what we do long term. And it was a huge success for us. So not to talk about workforce and all those things in a negative light, I think if anybody here has a takeaway from what we've learned over the last year, that was a huge win for us, and I encourage you guys to explore those opportunities. Business uh, continues to be strong for us. We certainly are preparing for what's to come potentially over the next 12 to eight, 18 months, but we're, we're grateful to be here, and, and thank you for having us. So I have to have notes. I'm not the great speaker like Nate is, but um, so hi everybody. I'm Lori Schaefer Wheaton, president of Agra Industrial Plastics. And first I just wanna introduce the team of people that I have with me today. Uh, our founder and chairman of the board, Dick Smith, our plant manager, just found out has been with us for 36 years, although he seems so young, Steve Farrell. Um, <laughs> director of IT, Warren Schaefer, purchasing manager, Jason Davis. Purchasing agent Corbin Settles, HR and safety manager, new to our team, Mackenzie Christie, quality engineer John Hanks, and safety coordinator Shane Woodsmall. Um, it is because of great people like this that Agra is able to do what it does every day. So I'm happy to have everybody here with us today. Would also like just to thank our sponsors, both Carl Nelson and um, Dexter. Uh, this is a great event, and I love the fact that it's going to continue to keep going. Um, I'm always amazed at the turnout from the community. So it is nice to be appreciated for what we do in Fairfield. And Fairfield is very lucky to have such a strong manufacturing backbone. And I think we appreciate it one on one because we can share best practices, but it's also nice that our community, community recognizes it as well. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Agra and what we do, uh, we are a large part industrial blow molder. We make large hollow plastic parts. And now we make centerpieces and vases. <laughs> no, just, um, but we actually specialize in the production um, and assembly and design of EPA compliant fuel tanks. Fuel tanks are about 50% of our business currently, so it's a big market for us. Um, a brief kind of just state of the union. Things are strong. I uh, can't believe we're in fourth quarter of 2022. Uh, but we're going to finish with a really strong year. And our OEM forecasts are still pretty bullish going into 2023. So we're feeling pretty good about that. We have started to see what I would just say is a slight slowdown in some of the other areas, maybe some orders getting pushed out um, or pulled out of the schedule. But all in all, business is looking really strong. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm still recovering from the numbers that were up on that screen, so I'm gonna ignore some of the uh, keynote slides. Uh, but right now, workforce, obviously, it's been a challenge. I don't know, I feel like going on 10 years. Uh, but just in the last quarter or so, we feel like the availability as well as the quality is actually, we're seeing um, some improvement in that area, so we're pretty excited about that. Um, Supply chain as well has been a huge challenge for a lot of us over the last couple years. And we're also starting to see improvements in lead time. <laughs> the person you guys are gonna be like, what? Um, in lead times. But of course, every single day we continue to get price increases. So that will continue to be a challenge um, as we go into 2023. Um, and again, some of the things, I guess when I think about what I'm most excited about, it's really about how we're going to apply automation to our business and the opportunities we have there. So that helps us with workforce, obviously, but it also helps us with quality, safety, efficiencies, you name it. And we have a super talented automation group that's now up to about six people. So it's a different skill set than we've had in the past. But I think the things that we are going to be able to achieve through that is just going to be really fun and um, is gonna really propel our business going forward. And then like Nate, before I wrap up, I have to acknowledge we have so many partnerships sitting in this room, um, us as well, Iowa State Bank, uh, we wouldn't be in business back in 1978, they took a gamble on us. Certainly we appreciate their longstanding relationship, but also H&H &H Mold, Traffix, Hickamottom Tile, Wheaton Companies, Caroline Nelson, Ideal Energy, and Indian Hills Community Colleges. So we also say thank you to all of you uh, for continuing to be our partners in business. Thank you.
and our friends at Dexter. Oh, and I'm going to throw my stuff on the floor. Gosh, I hate following Lori. I never know if I'm going to say enough or if I'm going to forget anybody. But um, Real quick, thank you to the FMA board for organizing this wonderful event. Look at the turnout. I, this is great to see this many people at the October meeting. We don't normally see this many folks here. Thanks to our sponsors, um, the Chamber. Uh, Krista, thank you for speaking. Uh, real quick, I'll do introductions. We've got Corey Westfall, Tim Conrad, Chad Manning, and Corey Haynes from Dexter with us today. Um, Business is doing okay. I'll just kind of start there. We're having uh, kind of a moderate year. I wouldn't say it's a record year, but we are still really recovering from COVID. The supply chain has really affected us. Labor, material shortages, and it's everything. It's electronics to rubber parts. We're, we're kind of past steel. Steel, I, I complained about steel last year, I think, but we're kind of past that now. Um, we just come off of a industry trade show. Our, our industry does a uh, laundry dry cleaning industry trade show. It's every two years this year. It's going to move to three years. Our next one will be in 2025. And we just introduced a brand new product. We are, we are developing and introducing a new, excuse me, soft mount washer. And what that means is it's a product that has a suspension, it's totally different than what we've ever built before. Our distributors have to buy our competition because we don't offer the product. So this is a game changer for us for growth and uh, uh, selling throughout the world. So. That's really the most exciting news I have. I don't want to use up too much more time and let someone else come up. Thank, Thank you. you. You're welcome. I'm just throwing stuff everywhere. That's what I do. <laughs> oh, here we go. See? You guys know the routine. I don't even have to be here. There you go, friend. Hi. Hi, I'm Rick Herman with H&H uh, &H Mold. And this is our 35th year. Um, Anyway, so, you know, you start to realize you're getting a little older when you look at that picture and you think, man, I wish I looked as young as that guy. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so this has been a real challenging year, um, and obviously the workforce and, uh, um, and just uh, the challenges of getting your materials, your supplies, the price increases. But the good thing is, you know, we've, we've, we went through last year, we went through this year, and we've had a really good year so far. And um, we're real thankful for working with agro-industrial plastics, work with traffics, and then our banker um, at Greg Lohenberg at Libertyville Bank. And uh, I brought my team with me, so I want to introduce them. We got Rick Clark. He does engineering and uh, mold work. And then Kayla, she runs the office. Mark Steinecker, engineer. Then we got... Uh, Brian Burchard, engineer, Mike Shank, engineer, James Foreman's been with us for the whole entire time, other than two months maybe, so 35 years, and then Brian Brewington, um, or yeah, Kyle, sorry. So what we're, we're looking for, for, uh, for next year would be that we gotta add some, add some more mold makers out there and we're looking for young people so if you guys have any relatives or anything that want to come back and get into some training programs, we're ready to go. And we really, we really build some really interesting tools. So that's, we're looking forward to next year. Thank you. Who wants to go next? There's Mike Parker. <laughs> you got it. I'm Michael Parker. I'm the plant manager of Traffics Devices. Uh, I told Mandy I didn't want to do this this year. We do this every year. We all talk about the same thing over and over. We're struggling on labor. We're all looking at automation. We're doing different projects. Uh, even though the labor's down, we've struggled to get orders out the building. Our sales are still up on unit-wise and dollar-wise. Um, we are partnering with some other uh, um, other companies, I guess. We're partnering with The Well to help with our labor issue. Um, Nate has offered some of his services to help us do some of our uh, assembly work. And we're also looking at the Iowa prison systems that have manufacturing areas within their uh, facilities. Um, the next year, we're, we're hoping our solar is finally up and going. It's taken a while. 
still waiting on some parts. Everything is installed other than the breakers themselves to convert us over to solar. So once those get installed, we'll have solar going in our buildings. Uh, we're looking at more automation. And I think that is about it. Thank you. Sorry, Mike, you should know by now I'm not a good listener. Um, the Nelson Company? We're having a pretty good year this year. We have the same problem as everybody else, getting people in the door to do the work um, is, is a big one. Getting the materials in is a big one. But with that being said, we actually are having a pretty good year this year. and. I guess we're looking forward to the next one. I brought Mindy with me today. She's our office manager. Uh, Bob Bowman, the president, couldn't be here today. And uh, I think just having some of the right people in the right place has made some of the differences for us this year, and starting with Bob Bowman. So that's about it for us. 50 years. Yeah. Nice. Woo! Ron Bovard, would you like to come up, sir? So this has been an interesting couple of years for us, just like everyone else here. Uh, uh, we took advantage of the last couple of years to uh, expand and build a new building and add some numerically controlled equipment in there, thanks to the help from Iowa State Bank and uh, uh, Access Energy uh, really helping us finance that. And we really appreciate you standing with us all these decades for 30 years or so. Uh, thank you very much. and. Uh, <clears throat> We've, uh, we've increased productivity and we've developed a couple of new product lines, including hurricane code uh, glazing system for church, large church windows that are very ornamental, approved uh, all the way down to South Florida, the highest codes in the United States. And that product line is taking off. And of course, it's taking a lot of debugging and interesting challenges as we go through there with supply chain shortages and labor shortages. Uh, but I think in the last month or so, as Lori said, the labor shortages seem to have picked up. And we've had some, some significant new hires in the last a month or two. So something seems to be loosening up. I'm not sure what it is. It doesn't matter. OK. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, the, uh, we also have an apprenticeship program uh, through the journeyman level for stained glass uh, approved by the U.S. Department of Labor. It's the only one in the United States, uh, the first one out and the only one that exists. Uh, we've won several prizes in the past couple years, including the Lucy C. Moss Award for the uh, Surrogate Courthouse in Lower Manhattan, uh, which is the most prestigious award that New York City offers for restoration. We also won first prize for the State of Connecticut's Restoration Builder, uh, Builders Association uh, Award uh, this past year, and uh, <clears throat> quite a few others. Uh, and. Uh, you know, we're really looking forward. Our sales have grown 27%, even though with supply chain shortages and labor shortages and debugging new products has created uh, great challenges for us, uh, uh, just like you have all suffered from. And, uh, you know, we look forward to resolving these issues and moving forward. Thank you very much. Aaron? Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Amy Greiner, Director of Special Projects with Air on Lifestyle Technology. Um, I'm not sure if everybody knows what we do, but we are a leading design and manufacturer of innovative air care device devices. You can see by our amazing centerpiece back there, a lot of the products that we do, private label and our own house brand label. Um, the past couple of years with the pandemic has actually been really good for us. When you have people at home and you want your house to smell nice. <laughs> so it's been really successful for us. Um, we have dealt with labor issues, the cost increases um, across our entire supply chain. One of our big pushes for the next few years is to do more domestically. So we do have a, a manufacturing facility in Mason City, Iowa. Um, and we are building on that North American supply chain by building a supply chain in Mexico. And then a lot of our products that are done in China have uh, what we call deco to make them look like metal or spray glitter or you know all those fancy things that you see on our products. A lot of that has to be done in China. So we are looking to build on that here domestically. Um, one of the big things that Aaron has done for the past couple of years also 
is an internal community task force. So we have an amazing team of uh, leaders in our company that go out and um, find volunteer efforts out there in the community. We've worked with Habitat for Humanity. Um, a big push lately has been the little, the little cupboards. So we've been filling those up, asking for donations. Um, so we're looking, we have a big focus to do more within the community. Uh, we also have a sustainability committee that is focused on finding those resins that are recyclable. We have used ocean plastics. Um, so really getting into that. And one last thing is we did do a solar panel field at our Mason City factory with Ideal Energy. So recently had a lot of um, attention on that. So thank you. Did I miss anybody? Okay, good. Matt Jody, I believe you have a few announcements from our fearless leader. <laughs> uh, on behalf of Chad Christensen, I really don't have anything because it's on your table, but the annual holiday party is December 8th. I hope that matches what's on the table. Actually, no, that's, I'm sorry, that's the... I'm sorry, that's the Chamber Awards. So big shout out, the annual awards banquet for the Chamber is April 20th. So you got that. Um, but for the Fairfield Manufacturing Association, our holiday party is December 8th. And you should see some additional details coming from Chad in November. So thank you for being here. Appreciate the Chamber. Thank you to the Chamber for all of this. Um, thank you for everybody for coming. And I'll give it back to you, Mindy. Thank you. So I see a, quite a few of my leadership Fairfield group. So if you are in the current leadership Fairfield class, could you stand up? Thank you to each of you for, for providing them the opportunity to come and learn with us um, and to learn of the ins and outs of our community. Um, they will definitely bring it all back to you. So don't forget to pick up your flowers before you leave. Joanna brought a ton of flowers. Um, we want to once again thank our sponsors, Carla Nelson and Dexter Laundry. Uh, Mayor Connie, would you please come announce our winners? And we will give checks. Chamber box. So excited. Nothing like a good little friendly competition. <laughs> So um, thanks for everyone's creativity, bringing your um, centerpieces. It's so cute. And it's also good to really see what you do in a different manner, the pictures. I, I loved it. And I know, you know, if you think you're saying the thing, same thing every year, yes, yeah, some of it's repeat. But also, it really helps. It makes me appreciate y'all more, Ted Truth, because you have certainly had major challenges the last couple of years. And, um, yeah, the grit and determination to get through it is just so important. And um, it's kind of like these flowers growing out of this tank. It's a little miracle every day. We didn't know that could happen. So um, let's say our runner up, our number two. $25 chamber box. Is Dexter. We love the little clothes and that little washing machine. <laughs> And our winner is Traffics Devices. They've got that holiday theme, Halloween, going on there. They had a little bit of an edge because of the color, I think. And, uh, but anyway, very cute display, and uh, it was a lot of fun. So thank you for everybody for participating. All right, we have one final thank you. Kelly and the Country Club have been so accommodating. We got out of the habit of RSVPing, folks kind of important. Uh, so yesterday when we came out here, they were accommodating, they added tables. We had a great afternoon, but we want to thank them for being accommodating to us. And finally, um, I hope to see you all tomorrow at Business After Hours at hy V. Uh, we thank you for all that you do. We thank you for all of the inspiration and for making Fairfield the wonderful community that it is. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>